So tonight, <clears throat> we're going to be taking our third look at the life and the apparently fruitless ministry of Jeremiah, a ministry that he never wanted to undertake. Now, in preparation for these messages that I've been giving, and we'll be giving one more after this today, I've been studying the book of Jeremiah really quite eagerly, actually. And here's what I've been asking God. I've been saying, God, I want you to show me what you might be saying to us through this discouraged prophet as we stay pretty much housebound and keep living in uncertain and sometimes discouraging times. What are you saying to us with this book of Jeremiah? Every book has a purpose. Every time you speak, there's something of value in it. So what is the value of the book of Jeremiah for each of us who are living in today's life? <clears throat> now, I'm aware that there are some Christians that think that this entire pandemic is God's judgment on the world for forgetting him. That's one view. But I'm thinking there's something more important to wonder about. And here's slide one. I want you to get a feel for what I'm wondering about. Um, and, and, it, and it's this, God, how, how are you using these difficult times to do us good? How is God, the God who loves us, God, how are you using these difficult times during the pandemic and other difficult times, whether it's cancer struggles, whether it's financial problems, whether it's relational difficulties, you use every difficult time to somehow do us good. So how are you doing it now? That's a question I'm concerned with. What's he up to? Another way of asking the same question. And then slide two, it has to be something. You've got to be doing something because Romans 8.28 is true. And what Romans 8.28 says, and you all know this, all things work together for good. But the question that I have in my mind, um, to who? All things work together for good to who? Well, the verse ends this way rather obviously, to those who love God and are called, and here's the phrase that I've capitalized on the screen, all things work together for good, but to who? Well, is this a limit he's placing on it? To those who love God, and secondly, if you love God, you're going to be called according to his purpose. So it seems to me, since that verse is true, it's in the Bible, and God, was in, God inspired, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write it, then we need to think about that very obvious verse that we've all memorized since we've begun going to church, I suppose. What, what is the Father's purpose? What, what is he up to? And what, whatever else he might be up to during this pandemic and during whatever troubles I'm going through, whatever troubles you're going through, Whatever else may be involved in his purpose, I think we have to agree from Scripture, I'm not taking time to defend this, but I believe you all agree it's true, that the center of all that God is about in every moment in this particular life is to display the unmatched relational beauty of Jesus by how his followers relate, how his followers relate to both God and to each other. That's what he's up to. So how is that working out? Well, if we can think about that as I get into this message here, let me introduce it a little further. I told you some of this before, but once in July of 1997, and again in September of 2018, a doctor called me while I was enjoying breakfast with a good friend, a good friend in Denver at one point, and secondly, a good friend here in Charlotte. And, um, and both times, the phone call that came in the middle of my breakfast was from a doctor saying that I had cancer. The tests were in, the diagnosis was clear, gastrinoma, one kind of cancer in 1997, and then leukemia, another kind of cancer in 2018. And the strange thing that happened, that has to do with Romans 8.28, the strange thing that happened, and this is my memory that's quite clear, both times, without me doing anything, without me trying to be spiritual, without me trying to listen to the Holy Spirit, none of that was going on. I was just kind of taken back, a little gut punch, you know. I've got gastronoma a couple of years later, a number of years later. I've got leukemia now. But I believe at that moment, both times, the Spirit inserted one word into my mind, and the word was important. And that one word really got me wondering. In the middle of these difficult diagnoses, I wasn't happy about it at all. God, what good are you up to in this bad news? Well, that's how God prompted me to think when I got some pretty bad news, actually, rather radically bad news. So now I'm asking, what good has God up to in me and in you as we live through these threatening times? Well, I would hesitate to say that God is guaranteed to protect us from getting the virus. 
Now we're praying that we're not going to get it. We're very happy when we call our family and we find out that nobody's gotten the virus yet. But is God guaranteed to protect us from the virus? Is that essentially what he's up to? Or is there something far more important to God than what we think is maximally important during a time like this? Is God up to something different and maybe something better? Maybe something guaranteed that God is up to in the middle of this virus? Question is, well, what is it? Especially when for some of us, God, God can seem so distant when we feel like we need him the most. Well, as I prepared for my first message a couple of weeks ago, I read and reread and I studied Jeremiah looking for the big picture in Jeremiah's story. A little bit of review now for those that maybe haven't watched the first two uh, messages that I've given. And I was thinking of all the verses in this mostly long chapters, 52 chapters in Jeremiah. And I was thinking uh, of all those chapters as pieces in a, in a puzzle, in a jigsaw puzzle. And I found myself wanting to arrange those pieces into a big picture that would do what every book in the Bible is doing. God is speaking to us in every book of the Bible. And it seems to me what God is doing in all 66 love letters, and now we're focusing on Jeremiah, God is doing this. He's answering questions that he wants us to ask. He's answering the questions that he believes are the important questions for us to ask. So therefore, we need to discern what questions is, are, are, are God answering. We need to be asking questions that God is answering in Jeremiah and the rest of the Bible. And as I study Jeremiah, I came up with three questions, among many others, I'm sure, that stood out to me that God is answering to at least some significant degree in the book of Jeremiah. Question one, slide one, or not slide one, slide three, actually. We're down to that point now. But question one is this, God, will you tell me something? Why did you devote the second longest book in the Bible? And I made that clear in my earlier message. It is the second longest book in the Bible. Psalms is number one. Jeremiah is number two. Looks like Isaiah should be number three because it has 66 chapters. But there's more Hebrew words in Jeremiah than there are in Isaiah. So back to the slide here. God, why did you devote the second longest book in the Bible to telling the story of a man who for 40 years delivered your word to people who never listened? That was the first question that got me thinking about the book of Jeremiah in my recent study. And then the second question, slide next, the next slide, number four, uh, the next, next question that got me thinking about was, was this, God, what was going on? What was going on in the people who heard, this is an important question, what was going on in the people who heard Jeremiah preach that prevented them from taking seriously and heeding what you were saying to them through Jeremiah. That's really clear. That happened in the 52 chapters of Jeremiah. He preached for 40 years, and very few, maybe one or two, but nobody really listened to Jeremiah. They didn't take him seriously. They didn't heed what Jeremiah was saying to them, what God was saying to the people in Judah through Jeremiah. Why? That's question two. Well, we talked about that a little bit. But uh, question three that I want to think about, and this is going to be for next week, but the third question um, that I believe uh, God is answering to some degree in the book of Jeremiah is an important question to me because we're talking about a godly man on a journey that was difficult. And a lot of us on the journey face a lot of difficulties. So my question is this, question three, God, what went on in Jeremiah as he was met with nothing but hardship and resistance during 40 years of ministry? What was happening inside this guy? And how did his discouragement and apparent defeat affect his relationship with you? Three questions. Well, in my first message, I developed those three questions and I just began thinking about them. That's what the first message is all about. But then last week in message two, I wanna review it just for a moment, wrestling with the first of the three questions I realized that in 40 years of Jeremiah failing to see any results, what occurred to me rather strongly as I continued to study Jeremiah, by God's standard, I believe Jeremiah was quite a success. But the standard had to be different than what we normally uh, have for what successful ministry looks like. So it became clear to me that in God's eyes, success looks more like this. The next slide, talked about it last week. I want to just mention it again. Success in a spiritual ministry has far more to do with perseverance through discouragement. Don't quit. 
faithfulness despite adversity. Don't change your message to get a better hearing. Perseverance through discouragement and faithfulness despite adversity. And as I was pondering those words again, just as I was getting ready for today's message, another thought occurred to me that ties in with that. We're all going to face the judgment seat of Christ, not the great white throne where eternal destiny is, um, is, is decided, already is decided, but it will be revealed. But at the judgment seat of Christ, we're actually going to give an account for our, our lives. It seems to me, and I believe this is true, our success as followers of Jesus will be determined by the character that kept us going more than by the results that we saw in our service to God. Now, all that's in message two. All right, enough review. Now, message three. And message three is my response to question two. What kept, let me rephrase it, what kept the Jews in Jeremiah's day from hearing and receiving words from God? Jeremiah said them, this is the word of God. Jeremiah said, God gave me this word and I'm now giving it to you. And they didn't listen as a nation. The citizens paid no attention to Jeremiah. And my burden, as I thought about this, whatever it was that kept them from listening to Jeremiah and heeding the word that he got from God, could that be going on in me today? Because God's still speaking. He didn't stop speaking in Jeremiah's day. He's been speaking ever since, and he'll be continued to be speaking. Speaking, I just said, well, he's speaking us, that's for sure, but he's still speaking. And I wonder how well we Christians and the Western culture particularly, but across the world, how well are we listening? So one thing that occurred to me to get the discussion started here on in, in this, in this message on, on question two, what, whatever it was that was going on inside Jeremiah's people, the citizens of Judah, and maybe going in us today, that drew them, it drew them to reject true teaching, and it moved them to accept false teaching. Now think about that. Something was going on in the people in, in Judah, and maybe in us today, that encourage us to look at true teaching and to go, ah, I'm not sure about that. And then to hear false teaching that we don't recognize as false, perhaps, in many cases we don't, but we think, well, that sounds like what I think God would be saying. So I'm going to go with that. And we're not even realizing that we're being led down a wrong path. That was the case in Jeremiah's day with Judah's citizens, and it might be going on with us. Why did God's people, me and you and all of us, Sometimes, at least for a season, and here's a difficult phrase, do we ever become lovers of lies? Is that possible to a Christian who has the mind of God? When Jeremiah began preaching, let me give you a little more history. When Jeremiah began preaching, Assyria was crumbling after ruling Judah for quite a long season, but they were getting weak. And then Jeremiah comes along, and says to people who were encouraged that in Syria, that Assyria was crumbling, and they were saying, maybe at last God's going to deliver us, and he's going to get rid of our problems, and we're going to have an affluent life. We're going to have this, uh, this land of good and plenty, and everything's going to be just fine, a milk and honey land. It's going to be ours to enjoy. No longer is Syria going to be in charge of us. But praise God, we're getting some freedom now. That's what we think God is doing. And then Jeremiah comes into that situation, and what he says is, unless you repent, Babylon that's just now starting to get strong, they're going to become an empire mightier than Assyria. And if you don't repent, Judah, you're going to be destroyed. You're going to be removed. All your citizens are going to be removed, if not all of them, most of them. A lot of people are going to die. The temple's going to be in, in, in rubble. Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah was saying, I don't have good news for you people. The only good news I have is you can repent. And that was the essence of Jeremiah's message. How, how did they respond to that? Well, when you hear what the people were saying to themselves, and we have some indication of that in several verses in Jeremiah, when you hear what the people were saying to themselves, to Jeremiah and to God, we maybe can get a picture of what God's people back then, and maybe sometimes today, were expecting God to do, and were really ticked at Jeremiah for contradicting their desires. Sometimes, what we as Christians expect God to do, now there's a little side trip just for a second, sometimes what we expect God ought to be doing is exactly what secular people think God should do, assuming that God exists. Well, if there's a God, I don't believe there is, secular people, many will say, the atheists will. 
I don't believe there's a God. But if there were a God, this is what he ought to be doing. He's not doing it, so I don't believe there's a God. So they have expectations of a God, if he exists, what he ought to be doing. Do we have expectations of what God should be doing because we know he exists? What do we think God is up to in the middle of these hard times? And if I were to summarize everything I'm going to say in the next number of minutes, in a word, what I think we naturally, wrongly, but naturally expect God to be up to is answering our prayers for what we feel we most want at any given moment. And so many of those prayers go unanswered. Now, to make the point, on the little, little side trip now, there was a French political scientist, a man named Oliver Roy, and a very bright man, apparently, had a, a scholarly interest in religion. And he published a book recently called Is Europe Christian? And he was wondering if Christian ideas were still influencing in any way, in any major way, European culture. And after studying it, at some length, I don't know if Oliver Roy was a Christian or not, but he certainly had a wise, clear perspective on things. He concluded, after looking to see whether European culture, laws, government practices, political issues, were Christian ideas um, evident in, in, the, in, the, in the culture of Europe. And his conclusion was this. He said Europe had become what he called desiring subjects. It's a phrase from Roy, desiring subjects. Desiring subjects, in Roy's mind, were people who believe, now here's the key to it, what we desire to do, we have a right to do. Isn't that true of America's culture today? What we desire to do, what we think is really good for us, and what we really want to happen in our lives, it really ought to happen. It really ought to happen. God should do it if we believe in God. God should cooperate with our desires. And it makes me wonder, a rather obvious question, is America in any meaningful sense Christian? It's a good country. I'm glad I'm part of America. I really am. But is it a Christian country in a meaningful sense? But even more to the point, without getting political, my, my question is even more telling, at least when I look in the mirror, are America's Christians Christian? Are we really living the Christian life? Are we following the God who actually is the author, obviously, of Christianity? Well, Judah citizens, self-declared followers of God, were not godly people. But why? Well, rather obviously, what they wanted for themselves took, pri or took priority over what God wanted for them. Let me say that again, and I hope this gets through to, hope it gets through to me. What Judah citizens wanted for themselves, they were desiring subjects. What they wanted for themselves took priority over whatever God might be wanting for them. That wasn't their concern. God, what do you want for us? We know what we want, and we rather expect your cooperation. God longed for his people to love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength in the middle of discouragement, in the middle of affliction, in the middle of adversity, in the middle of walking through life in a narrow road. You love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That'll be your joy. That'll be your purpose. The day will come and you'll be thrilled that you followed my instructions and you learned to depend on my spirit for you to love me well. But that's not what you're interested in, Judah. God's people, his people, wanted God to provide for them whatever it was they wanted. And what they wanted is what all of us at some level, of course, want. And we're not wrong for wanting it. We want a life that goes well. We don't want to get the virus. We want to have enough money to pay our bills. But Judah had become desiring subjects of the kingdom of self, not desiring subjects of the kingdom of God. And Judah's religious teachers were telling them lies lies that a good God would prove cooperative with their desires. If God is good, and we know he's good, say false teachers, of course God is good, he loves us, and because he loves us, he will be cooperative to whatever his people passionately want without any recognition that as 2 Timothy 3, 4 says, these people had become lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That's a strong indictment in the book of Timothy from the Apostle Paul. And as a result, Judah citizens, and to some degree, maybe us sometimes, they were now lovers of lies. What do all of us naturally want when we're hurting? The answer is relief. 
is that what God guarantees? Or does he guarantee perseverance? Does he guarantee that we're going to remain faithful if we trust him? Our problem, as we see it, as Judah citizens saw it very clearly, maybe not so much us, maybe very much us, our problem isn't sin, our problem is pain. Now, the next slide is uh, one of the few verses I'm going to be looking at to make my points here. I want to make sure you know that I'm getting this in the scripture. Jeremiah spoke into that culture who were dis determined that their desires were what mattered the most to God. And I don't mean their godly desires, their desires for their own well-being as they understood the word well-being. And Jeremiah said, acknowledge your guilt. That's in Jeremiah 3.13. Can you imagine the response of the, of the citizens of Judah? You told us to acknowledge our, our guilt. Don't you see we have a more important problem that whatever we're doing wrong, we're not doing that much wrong for crying out loud, but we're scared. We're worried. We're hurting. We're not in good shape. God loves us. Things ought to be different than they are. We're going to listen to teachers who are going to give us the message we really want to hear. And Jeremiah tells us that he heard what the people were saying. In Jeremiah 2 and verse 35, the next slide another very disturbing verse, the people in, in Jeremiah's day, what they were saying was, I, I, I've, done, I've done nothing wrong. Acknowledge my guilt? O over what? Oh, I guess I made a couple of mistakes, but my issue was not whatever I've done wrong because I really haven't done anything wrong. I've done nothing wrong. Get off my case, Jeremiah. And in verse 25, even to make it more uh, strong, more apparent, I don't have a slide for this, but I want you to hear it. The people looked impatiently while Jeremiah was saying, acknowledge your guilt. And the people who were saying I've done nothing wrong, they turned to Jeremiah. And this is a quote from Jeremiah 2 and verse 25. They said this to Jeremiah, save your breath. Preacher, shut up. Save your breath. I'm in love with these foreign gods. In other words, I'm in love with false teaching. I'm in love with false teachers. Save your breath, Jeremiah. I'm in love with these foreign gods, and I can't stop loving them now. Are they talking the language of an addict? I can't stop worshiping a God that seems to promise me the relief that I'm most after. Forgiveness, that's not what I'm after. Becoming holy, no interest. What I'm really after is my life becoming more comfortable. Jeremiah, that's not what you're telling me God is saying, so I don't believe you're a messenger from God, and I wish you'd just stop talking. Save your breath. Don't even talk anymore. Well, what I want to do in the next little bit in this still a brief message, I'm going to look at just um, uh, two more verses among many more that make the point. What's the point that I'm after? That God's people in Judah thought it was right to be subject to their own desires. They were desiring subjects. What they believed, and this is the key to it now, hear, hear this one, what I desire to do I have a right to do. I want to live with my girlfriend before I get married. I can't imagine God's opposed to that. I love her. I'm, I'm supposed to, I, I want to live with my boyfriend and he's really a good guy and he's got a lot more money than I have. And if we move in together, we're going to get married someday. I don't see a problem with that. And if you're telling me that's wrong, I don't want to listen to you. Give me some false teachers and I'll believe they're speaking the truth from God. What I desire to do, I have a right to do. Now here's a very important point. People who think like that are prey to false teachers. They're easy prey to false teachers. Ah, one more slide here, slide number eight. Look at Jeremiah 5.31. This is one of the most disturbing verses in all of Jeremiah. Listen to it. Jeremiah is saying, God's saying through Jeremiah, the prophets prophesy falsely, and my people love to have it so. I love false teaching. Am I drawn to false teaching? What is in me? Well, I've already shared what is in me. That makes me want to believe a false teacher. I want God to be a God who's going to fulfill my expectations for what I think a good life looks like. How many professing Christians today, and let me sound without, I don't want to be cynical or unkind, but I want to be realistic here. I, I do wonder how many professing Christians, and am I among them in some form? How many professing Christians listen to pastors and television preachers who with smiling assurances tell their listeners that God has great things in store for them? Well, that's true. 
God has great things in store for every one of his children. He has great things in store for this messed up world. He has a wonderful plan. The story ends terrifically beyond our possible expectation. God has great things in store for you, say false teachers. But what do they mean by great things? Well, you'll understand the kind of teaching that you've heard from different Christian leaders. Things like this. These are the great things that false teachers talk about. Are you ill? God hates your illness. Well, that's true. But because he hates your illness, you can be guaranteed he wants to heal you. If you just have faith, you will be healed. I can recall a woman came to me in private practice years ago and said, Dr. Crabb, I'm a young mother. I'm, in my, I'm 35, 36 years old. I have three little children. And the doctors tell me I'm going to die within six months. That's the longest I have to live. And I want to write a letter to my children, letting them know how much I love them. So when I'm gone, they can read their letter from mom. And my pastor told me that I should never write that letter. It means I don't have faith that God's going to heal me. That pastor was a false teacher. And I said to her exactly that, write the letter. It's a wonderful thing that shows your heart for your children that you love so much that are going to miss you so deeply, but they're going to have a letter. Are you ill? God's going to heal you now in this life. Another false teaching, are you out of money? Well, in his providence, and if you declare God's favor, your bank account will soon have the money that you need, and maybe then some. And thirdly, just a lot of illustrations, I'm just picking out three, somewhat at random. Are you struggling against sin? Oh, my brother, my sister, you don't need to be there. What are you, battling against a thirst in your soul that is not now quenched? Don't you understand that God wants you really happy? And, and what I want you to understand, if this false teacher talking, that you're going to hear other teachers tell you that you got to wait for heaven. No, 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 no. Heaven is now. The good life of heaven is available now in its fullness. Our good, good father wants his children to always feel fulfilled, never empty. Our good, good father wants us to realize that the struggle against sin is really over. The battle against unquenched thirst has ended. Man, I'd like to believe that. The Bible doesn't teach it, therefore I can't believe it. I look in the mirror and I realize it's not happening in my life, but if I haven't got the Bible in front of me, I might say, well, maybe that's what God is saying, but no, that's not what we're hearing in the scriptures at all. That's false teaching. And to use a fancy word about it, that is what I call, what other people call when they like using fancy words, anthropocentric. And all that means, it's a false gospel that is centered on my wants, my wishes, my desires. It's a gospel that calls us to surrender to a false God, a God that doesn't exist, an unholy God who is ruled by our every desire, not by his holy desires. Well, those who accept false teaching and believe what Paul in Galatians called a different gospel, they're going to lose any desire to meaningfully repent. Why? Well, sin isn't the problem. Difficulties are my problem. Come on, God, you love me. Get with it. Now, here's the second passage that I mentioned we briefly look at. It's in Jeremiah 8, 12, the next slide. Speaking to people who believe they had every right to follow whatever, wherever their desires led them, God said this rather provocative sentence. These people, they didn't know how to blush. Jeremiah 8, 12. Am I really wrong to look at porn? I don't do it very often, and it really relaxes me. Aren't you blushing over your porn habit? I, uh, well, I, I know I'm not really there for my spouse the way I probably should be, I suppose, but you have no idea the pain that I feel in my relationship with that man, with that woman. Uh, you know, I really have no choice but to keep my distance. No blushing in that man, no blushing in that woman, and that's sad. Well, the third example, and I've been guilty of this, so few people, if any, have really showed a real interest in where I am in my life and what's going on inside of me. No one really listens to me when I share a struggle the way I want to be listened to. I, I've got to, you know what, I just got to keep not only social distance, I got to do that now, I understand, but I got to keep personal distance as well. If I get really curious about others, it just makes me feel more invisible because nobody's really curious about me. That can't be wrong. You want me to love people that don't really give a hoot about who I am? That's asking too much. 
When I'm thinking like that, I don't know how to blush. That's your problem. They don't know how to blush. Now let me close my comments here by suggesting what was the false teaching in Jeremiah's day? I want to get more specific now. I've already suggested a lot of it, but I want to put it into a little different framework. What was the false teaching that was rampant in Jeremiah's day? False teaching that perhaps is the same false teaching that Jude, next to the last book in the Bible, said was creeping into a church that he was familiar with. A false teaching that was true in Judah under Jeremiah's day, in Jeremiah's day, that was true in Jude's day, 30 years after Jesus went back to heaven, and false teaching that may be very widespread but subtle, creeping into our church culture today. And I believe the false teaching of today that we need to get a hold of uh, comes down to wrong answers to the two biggest questions of life. Question number one, who is God? That's an important question. Question number two, who are we? Two really important questions. I want to suggest that there are obviously many pathways for truth to get twisted into false teaching. And that, by the way, is a verse in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 8 and verse 8, where the Lord says, your teachers have twisted the word of the Lord by writing lies. That's an actual verse in Jeremiah 8 and verse 8. Now, there are many ways for truth to get twisted into false teaching. But I believe that a false understanding of who God is and who we are leads us into a false understanding of what a good, discipling, spiritually forming Christian life really looks like. We get a wrong picture of it when we have a wrong understanding of who God is and who we are. Well, let me think about that just for a few, a few moments here. Who is God? Well, read through Jeremiah, and if you haven't read through it, take my word for it, that the, Jer the God that was revealed through Jeremiah in the book of Jeremiah is a God who was mighty angry. He hates sin. He's a holy God of passionate wrath. I will destroy. I will judge sin. God is a holy God who is opposed to sin. In Romans 1.18, it was true back in Judah's day. It's true in Paul's day. It's true in our day. In Romans 1.18, Paul said, the wrath of God, the New Testament, does not contrast with an angry God in the Old Testament, a loving God in the New because Paul is saying in the New Testament that the wrath of God is revealed against all, all, all ungodliness and unrighteousness. That truth is the beginning of the gospel. It isn't the end of the gospel, but it's the beginning of the gospel. But false teachers today, and in Jude's day, I believe, false teachers would set God's grace and love in opposition to his holiness and his wrath. Did you hear that? God's grace and love are viewed as opposed to the idea that God's, well, he's holy and he's wrathful, he's angry. And that encourages people to effectively deny that God is still the holy God of passionate wrath. And a false choice is presented to Christians in this false teaching. A false choice is presented. We're required either to believe God is holy and hates sin, which is true, or God is loving and hates our hurt, which is also true. You don't have to make a choice there. Of course God hates our hurt, and he's doing everything about it that is wise to him, and he's going to end our hurt forever, but he is and always will be a holy God who hates sin. The path to false teaching declares that the God of holy judgment is the Old Testament God. Jesus came to reveal a God of grace and love that cannot at the same time, this God cannot at the same time be holy, 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 whose justice demands punishment for sin. That cannot be the God that Jesus revealed. So God becomes not a holy God of passionate wrath, but then we reduce him to more like a, a pretty good dad or maybe a smiling grandfather who has standards and wants his kids to be obedient, but when they are disobedient, um, he's really more tolerant and doesn't really want to punish much as he understands things. Um, he has standards, but he really isn't concerned all that much that his children obey them. Believe that, and you really are thinking that God is a God of tolerance. And therefore, our sin really isn't much of an issue. Repentance isn't required for a godly life. 
But the path descends even farther from a holy God of passionate wrath to a smiling grandfather, a father figure who has standards but isn't terribly strict about them. When the children disobey, he's still known to be very tolerant. The path goes down even further in false teaching. And now it descends into dismissing any need whatsoever for brokenness and repentance in an already forgiven Christian. I'm forgiven. I'm not condemned. That's a truth. I got the Bible verses for that. But false teaching, the God of false teaching today, is often understood to be no more than a helpful God with useful, useful principles to follow so that our lives go well. Let me summarize that. Who is God? Well, no longer the holy God of passion or wrath. We don't believe in that anymore. Well, the Old Testament people did. Some of you legalists believe in that, but we know better. And we've reduced God to the fatherly God of strict standards who's more known for his tolerance than for his strictness. The awfulness of sin really isn't the issue. And grace is cheapened by seeing it as kind of a wink and a smile attitude of tolerance. And now with repentance no longer needed, God is commonly believed in many of our circles in the Christian world today to be a helpful God of useful principles to make our life go according to our expectations. Who is God? A lot of heresy there. Who are we? Well, through Jeremiah's eyes, as revealed by God, the holy God of passionate wrath, Jeremiah saw God's people as arrogant people who really deserve judgment. To put it even more strongly, who deserve eternal misery. They've turned away from God, the source of joy, the source of life, the source of hope. Eliminate him and you're destined to misery if you don't come to God. As Dorothy Sayers put it, if you want your own way, God will let you have it and hell is the enjoyment of your own way forever. Yeah, I understand it's true that we all bear the image of God and therefore our dignity rests in that. We bear the image of God. That's a huge truth in scripture. But ever since the fall in Eden, and until we're made entirely new in heaven, depravity is still a real issue in our souls. Depravity is still a problem. It's still a real concern in our lives as Christians. But such thinking that we're really arrogant people who deserve judgment, well, that's politically incorrect, that's religiously incorrect. So can, can we just kind of reduce that a little bit? And can we say that, no, 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 we're not arrogant people who just are so rebellious that we deserve terrible judgment. No, 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 that's ridiculous. We're, here's how I'd put it, we're scoldably selfish people. Oh, we're self-centered to some degree and we deserve a scolding, but punishment, no, of course not. Slap in the wrist, yes, I suppose. And many of us who do lead mostly unselfish appearing lives, a lot of us are rather giving people. I'd like to think I am sometimes, and I'm sure you are in many ways. But sometimes if you buy into this idea that we're scoldably selfish, we give little thought to discerning what the real self-centered motivations may be beneath a lot of our good deeds. I don't want to go there. I'm just scoldably selfish, but I'm doing better. Praise God. Things are, work, work, are working out just fine. But then we go to one more level than the false teaching. Life can be so rough, and we have reason to hurt. Of course we hurt. We feel pain. Of course we do. We get frustrated with things. So false teachers get a real marketable message going that draws crowds. False teachers urge us to think more about the relief we desire from our pain and less about the forgiveness we need for ongoing fellowship with God. The pathway leads us to believing, this is the depth of what I think is false teaching about who we are, that at core we're understood to be hurting strugglers and nothing more. We are that, but is that who we are at the core? Hurting strugglers who deserve, that's the key word, who deserve to be understood, encouraged, and helped. Final thoughts, follow this. When hurting strugglers worship a helpful God, they feel entitled to a more comfortable life. And whatever God provides that is the God they worship. When a hurting struggler worships a helpful God, that hurting struggler feels entitled to a more comfortable life. When scoldably selfish people, who do better most of the time, but they still deserve a scolding now and then, when scoldably selfish people worship a fatherly God, who though he may have some strict stand, standards, is really quite tolerant. We can count on him to, to overlook it. He's tolerant. 
Those people, scaldedly selfish, worshiping a fatherly God who's rather tolerant, they never develop an intimate relationship with a God who really should always be nice to us. When he's good to us, well, he's just doing what he's supposed to do. There's no real relationship there. It's like a spoiled brat who on Christmas morning has a lot of presents. He doesn't run to his father. That little girl doesn't run to her daddy and say, oh, daddy, you're just so wonderful. Um, but all that they mean is um, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're just a good father, and I'm very happy about that. But there's no deep relationship, no soul-to-soul -soul connection when scaldably selfish people worship a fatherly God who's tolerant. But hear this. When arrogantly, when arrogant people who rightly deserve judgment, eternal judgment, are we that arrogant? Are we that sinful? Are we that proud? When arrogant people who rightly deserve eternal misery meet the holy God of passionate wrath, here's what happens. They discover grace. The same grace that led God to tell Jeremiah, Jeremiah 33, 25, he says this. The people were saying, God, you've given up on us. We want no parts of you. You're not meeting our expectations. Have you just decided to reject us? You want nothing more to do with us? We don't like you very much, God. And God responds to that, Jeremiah 33, 25, and says, I would no more reject my people than I would change my laws that govern right, that, that govern night and day. Let me say it again. I would no more reject my people than I would change my laws that govern night and day. I'm a lover. God's a lover of people, but his love for people requires grace. And when they discover the grace in their arrogance and their helplessness and their recognition that they deserve judgment, when they discover a grace, the grace that moved God to make Jesus bear our sin, the Bible says he actually became sin for us, and he endured the punishment that our sins deserved. When that becomes real to our souls, then God becomes our greatest pleasure, and we'll, we'll follow him anywhere, because he's really, he's really quite something. There's just nobody like him, but we're not going to see it until we recognize what we deserve, and we've gotten the exact opposite. That's why God, with a heart full of grace and love, said to the arrogant people in Judah, there's more in the book of Jeremiah than just denunciation and prophecies of judgment. That's there. But with a heart full of grace and love, the arrogant people in Judah, he says the same thing that he says to us. This is Jeremiah 3.22. Hear these incredible words. Come back to me, and I will heal your wayward hearts. Come back to me, and I will heal your wayward hearts. Resist false teaching and live. Let me close by just reciting the best known, perhaps, the best known benediction in all of Scripture, the last verse in the book of Jude. After Jude said there's false teachers creeping into the church, they're perverting grace into sensuality, they're perverting grace into whatever you wish for, you have a right to get, and God should cooperate. And God says, I'm not going to let my people be overtaken by that. Listen to what he says, the final benediction. This is my closing prayer. Now to him who is able to keep you, and that's me, that's you, from stumbling into false teaching. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Thank you.